This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Hope you're doing well out there and surviving whatever COVID catastrophe is afflicting your part of the world. I hope this helps. This conversation featuring Tommy Kovasari from the outfit Amorphous. He's the group's guitarist. He's, I believe he's a foundation member, so he's one of the fellows that started the band. He certainly appeared on every album. And uh, he's a very nice fella to have a chat with as well. I enjoyed this one. I enjoy most of them, I must say, but uh, some are just very pleasant. And this is a good example of a very pleasant conversation, probably because he's Scandinavian. And I've always noticed the Scandos are so easy to converse with. They remind me of we Australians in some ways. They're always up for a bit of a chat, a bit of a yarn. Don't ever seem in too much of a hurry. Now, the catalyst for the conversation with Tommy is due to the launch of the new album from Amorphous. It is titled Halo, and it will be out on the 11th of February. If you've tuned in via the podcast, well, I'm going to play a song for you. It's titled The Moon, and it is the first single or thereabouts from Halo. When that's finished, we'll cut to the conversation. For you people who are listening and watching via the YouTube app, we're going to cut to the conversation right now. Let's go. Tommy. Tommy, man, hey. Smith. How, how are you going, mate? <laughs> oh, fine, thanks. I, this... uh, yeah, it's uh, right, 12 go, o'clock. Mate. You know, wintry Helsing. It's uh, we're, well, I'm in the subtropics here, mate. So it's been about 34 degrees Celsius. You, you work in Celsius, being Finnish, I think, don't you? Not Fahrenheit, but um, 34 degrees Celsius, and tonight it's going to be about 21 degrees. So there you go. Wow, <laughs> that's nice. I would change it for this. <laughs> oh, I bet, I bet. Yeah, it's uh, although I've got to say, Scandinavians, and I, I hope it's okay to to put. Finnish people in that that broad basket, but you remind me a bit of Australians. Very laid back. Yeah, yeah very laid back. I've spoken to enough of you now. Uh, that would yeah. be my perspective on things, is that you're very laid back and very easy to get along with, I've got to say. That's what I've noticed. I've spoken to so many of you guys. I've spoken to Oli Pekka before, um, and, uh, yeah, I've just noticed that, mate. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you guys, particularly the musicians over the years. Oh, uh, cool. Well, I, I feel the same. Once we were only in Australia, and I felt the same. Like it was, I liked the people and uh, the atmosphere. It was kind of in Finland, I guess. Same kind of uh, sense of humor, I would say. Definitely, sense of humor and drinking of beer culture. The beer culture is very similar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the most important. Right. Hey, how have the how have the calls been going in support of this new album, Halo? Yep. Excuse me. Can you repeat? How, how how have the calls been going? Has the reception been good? Yeah, so far it's been. It's just starting to have like opinions outside the, from the band, and uh, it's been very positive, and uh, we are very satisfied with ourselves. So that's uh, like mm-hmm. meeting at first to us, but uh, of course at that this time when album is almost co- coming out it's like of course you're eager to know what other people are thinking of it I, i've been following the band since about was elegy so 1996 is that right to and ella was probably the first in market album that i bought after i got into you guys and uh, as okay. I, as i say i spoke to uh ollie Pecker, uh in support of the the last album when that came out it's about three years ago or so that was a pretty good album uh, i didn't mind that one there but God help me for saying this, I didn't expect for Halo to be as strong as what it is, okay? Because it's heavier. Okay. Um, you surprised yeah. me. I've got to tell you, you did surprise me. Like, it's not that you guys release, you guys don't release bad material. It's not like there's bad albums out there, a la Megadeth's Risk and all of that sort of shit. But I was, I was very, very pleasantly surprised by how heavy the album was. I feel like as though you're drawing on some of your more old school influences. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I guess so. Some of the riffs are maybe heaviest what we have done 
for a while. And uh, <clears throat> also, I, th- I think it's the production well, why it's it's uh, less orchestrations than in, on Queen of Time, for example. I think so. It that makes the guitars be more like uh, in your face, and uh, the overall sound is heavier, I guess. And also, mm. I think the songs itself, they are like uh, maybe a little bit more complex uh, for uh, last album, if you compare. And maybe you need to have like few spins more. That's what I feel, but I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I've, I've had, see, I only got it last night, so I've managed to listen to it twice all the way through. So one of them when I was making the kids dinner and I had the AirPods in and I was listening to it and that's when it caught me because you know you I do a lot of this you, you you're listening to an album and you sort of you can tune out a bit okay because you get mm. focused on what you're doing at hand you know what it's like with a family you've got to do all these different things yeah. in order to keep the wheels turning but there's a few moments there where I had to stop and really pay attention and rewind um, and particularly with your guitar playing um, this time around. Um, you're still using the custom ESP Eclipses, I take it. I saw the video that was released a couple of hours ago. So you're still using that guitar, but did you did you really focus on the guitar sound at this time around more than, say, you've done on previous albums? Uh, yes and no, because uh, this time we did it in Helsinki and uh, Jens was producing like from distance. No. So... Uh, so uh, we used, like, personally, I used a Mesuga amp. I don't know if you know. It. Sure. But that was a very, very good guitar sound. But, uh, of course, Jens was reamping it in Sweden again. So <laughs> I have no idea what he was using. But it, it's very similar than we used on the, when I played it in. So, uh, yeah, we always try to catch, like, the perfect guitar sound and uh, this and Queen of Time I think I've been like most satisfied so far to the guitar sound overall I feel like it's a tr- it's a natural guitar sound for you that sound that you've got now like mm. it's actually how you you know like Keith Richards there's that old saying that Keith Richards can plug in to an amp in any guitar anywhere in the world and sound like Keith Richards I feel like you've now mm. got a tone where it's like hey that's Tommy's mm. Yeah, that's. I'm glad to hear that. If it's like that, and uh, it's to me, it's always I've been like liking the like passive mi- microphones and uh, just uh, gain what I can have it from the amps directly. I've never been using the distortion pedal pedals except when I was 15. I had uh, some uh, heavy pedal too. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Boss pedal, of course, and that's yeah. classic, of course. But uh, that's how I like it nowadays. Like just having a gain from the amp, and I think that's the strongest and the biggest sound that way. Because distortion pedals, I think they're putting it smaller. But in, in some cases, it's very good. But in amorphous sound, I think it's not that good. Did you write using an acoustic guitar? Like, is that where the ideas start, or is it all from the electric guitar? Uh, I used to play, like, when I was young, electric guitar without amp at home. So <laughs> oh. I, I think that yeah. that's why maybe I have it quite much uh, power in it. And uh, it's important to me that having that, uh, what's the, what is called, resonation mm-hmm. from guitar. Like, uh, so that's why I've been loving uh, Les Pauls and also ESP Les Paul models. I, I can like feel the resonation as, as well, and uh, while I'm playing. So, hmm. hey, I've I've always had this perception that Amorphous is a band that has you got many songwriters in the band, and the songwriters bring in do the songwriters bring in near to completed tracks into the studio environment, and then other musicians add their touches. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, that's true. Nowadays, it's Everybody have the, some kind of home studio, or you don't even need to have a studio, but mm. you know, uh, you can produce like pretty good demo at home, and then it's very easy to like represent to other guys. Of course, when we start to rehearse the songs, <clears throat> everybody is having like their own elements to it, and uh, maybe they are changing a little bit, <clears throat> not not too much, but uh, there's al- always like that much space. To like you can like 
you can put your own effort to it. But also because we have been together so long, you know kind of style that everybody is playing. So you're maybe trying to seek that to your demos already. Like mm. like uh, if you can imagine like, okay, Opu is probably playing this kind of bass. So. Mm. So, so like that. But yeah, of course, it's like always teamwork, like uh, the finishing the songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can definitely tell you it's very cohesive. You've always had a very cohesive sound, uh, no matter what you were trying to do with the sound, which has evolved, of course, since you guys first started. So uh, just about the lyrical themes this time around, um, it, w- is there a concept through the lyrics that links all of the songs together on the album, or are they all separate and singular entity, so to speak. Well, yeah, it's uh, Pekka Painolan who wrote our lyrics outside of the band. Uh, I think he, he said that there is like certain team which is like the, it's happening like in uh, like in a t- times when people were like wandering to Finland area like hmm. pagan times and stuff like that. But that's maybe a loose loose concept uh, because there's a lot of different stories still I think so I wouldn't say it's like straight concept album but uh, of course there is some some same themes as lo- same themes than with, with the previous albums as well but uh, Pekka never like uh, explaining it too, too much to us and uh, I don't think it's necessarily either because I think it's very important as, uh, also to have like your own own feelings out the lyrics yeah i like the mystique around it too i don't think lyrics need to be explained mm. to the nth degree you know there's a lot of mystique around what i think you guys do and you know we we living in australia we find a lot of that that viking heritage that you've got and a lot of that arctic circle stuff that you bring mm. into your music we find that very interesting as i'm sure you find might find some of our stuff interesting but that's you know that's mm. that's cool to hear that now I've got to ask, and I've asked this of all of the artists, Nuclear Blast artists in particular, um, because you you do have a platform where you can keep on releasing records through COVID. So obviously it's had a massive impact because you weren't able to fly to Sweden and work with Jens in his studio. Mm -hmm. But was that the only challenge that you faced? Well, I think not that much challenge. I think this time we had obviously more time to focus as well to composing and uh, to actual studio time mm. because uh, now we did it mainly in Helsinki. That's like I can almost see from my window the studio where the building where it is. So yeah. we didn't have to be so tight schedules and like every day. So we could a little bit have like uh, more loose schedules and uh, having more time we could just focus on this not because we didn't have any gigs and uh, Mm. so in that that's maybe only positive thing about this situation is that uh, we had time (laughs) to prepare and uh, Mm. do this but uh, now when the album is almost out it's like I'm just waiting for to get to tours and uh, gigs but We'll see, hopefully. Look, the, yeah. the, the other issue, I hope I can ask this question, but the financial side of it for the band, I've, I've spoken to a number of artists who've told me that it's, it's pushed them beyond the wall. They're in debt now because of mm. keeping, pe- keeping road crew and the, the associated people who are very important to the band to keep you guys functioning and well-oiled and on the road when you need to go back on the road. Um, has financially, has it been very difficult for you through this period? Well, of course, it's it's uh, incomes have been like uh, going down dramatically, of course. But I think we are so like musicians of the band uh, are still like uh, can manage because we have royalties, we have events when we are going to studio and things like this. But uh, like like you said, like the road crew, the like roadies and technicians. They are more more fucked in this situation because there's a lot of my friends. They don't have like uh, any income from anywhere, mm. not from government or anything. And this is the problem, of course, everywhere in the world, I guess. So, but we have been managed, and of course, there's nothing you can do. Actually, you don't spend the money 
I'm just spending time in my cabin and only <laughs> I'm spending Reading money books. only yeah. like yeah mm-hmm. and food and wh- whatever but you cannot travel and going to bars or anything like that so yeah it's uh interesting interesting times the the but, biggest uh, issue yeah. well I think the the big one of the biggest challenges that I think the industry is going to face when we have, whenever we get over this fucking thing is the venues most of them are closed like mm. I know around me half of them are closed and we only had four or mm. five to begin with anyway because we're not a big market in Australia as you know a bit like Finland we're not mm. a massive market we're yeah. very geographically dispersed um, yeah have you you know has management been talking to you about about what that looks like when you do go back on the road like I know tours are now booked right out until some of them I think I've seen come through for 2000 and, uh, end of 2023. Mm. So almost two years yeah. or at least 18 months away. So a lot of the venues that are around are actually booked already almost two years in advance. Mm. Has that been something that you've had to talk about and consider? Uh, I think we started to like think that or the management started to think that already because we knew that we we're going to release album in February 2022 like almost two years ago so of, of, okay. I think they were booking booking the like reservations already that that okay. case we are l- lucky but I know what you mean because some venues I I heard that that you cannot uh, move to your gig like next year anymore because every day is full already like yeah this year some big big venues so that's insane like it's like train with just there's so many I, I don't know what's happening when if someday some, everything is open and there's like live shows every every night in some places so I don't know how how it's much two tier isn't it audience no. there will be and yeah yeah well I, I hopefully to... people have this mm. sorry you go mate you're right. yeah hopefully yeah hopefully they just have a like so much uh, they're so tired of these situations or hopefully they are going to live shows like <laughs> every day in a week but I don't I don't think so but uh, there's just no we'll confidence is, yeah in, in Australia like there's just no confidence at the moment so I've been you know the guitarist Pliny you know the instrumental guitarist anyway he's a Australian guy um, I'm pretty sure I've received four updates now that his gigs have been pushed further and further out because mm-hmm. of COVID restrictions. We got horrendous restrictions here. And um, mm-hmm. it's it's all about density inside of a venue. So you can only have a certain amount of people inside of a venue and you've got to be socially distanced and all this bullshit. Yeah. And it's like, for God's sakes, I mean, this the, we're, all we're doing through these, through these directions, they call them directions here in Australia, capital D directions, or certainly mm-hmm. Queensland and my state. All we're doing is pushing out how long this thing is going to take to go through the community. Nobody wants anybody to die. Um, nobody's suggesting mm. that for a moment. Nobody's sane anyway. But for God's sakes, yeah. industry, business, we have to get back to earning money again. Yeah. And that's that semblance of normality. And one of the key things for us as music fans is seeing Amorphous Tour Australia. That's something that we look forward to and something that we actually need to see, you know. So, I, I mean, it's mm. it's... I've been. I, I don't like psychics. Okay, I hate all of that shit. Generally speaking, but I've been so frustrated with it on behalf of the musicians and myself as a gig-going person. I'm a musician too, you see, and all of our venues have been mm. outside, and we've had to play gigs outside. But I've been following a few psychics to talk to to try to understand how long they see this this whole situation, the Omicron and the next variant, whatever it's going to be called, come through. Mate, they're talking about 2024. Some of them before it looks mm. normal again. And I think I don't I don't think we can last that long. Because there's yeah. so much public yeah. money there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot, a lot of like from this industry of course they have already changed the changed their like what they're doing and uh, you have to think everything like again and uh, yeah, it's I I feel lucky that I'm not like 25 years old now who is just like is pushing the first album or I don't know how they feel like because I've been doing this for a long time so I can okay <laughs> two years is okay to me like uh, okay I can just wait or something yeah. but there's a lot of like uh, people who who who's this situation is even worse so so yeah 
yeah, I don't know. It, it's crazy in Finland as well. Like everything is like, okay, we open everything, then you shut down everything and yeah. you don't know what's going to happen. And you, you don't build a life. So like in one day, uh, one a warning, like you have to know it like half a year before, of course, you know. So uh, I don't know. I'm tired of this, <laughs> this yeah. shit. But, like especially when you have like vaccinated people, what I feel. Uh, you should be ready to a little bit like open things and then you yeah. everybody knows what's going on and it's like your own responsibility and your risk as well but uh, I don't know hmm. it's not easy no easy. it's not easy I think the, uh, the, the I, I, I have some sympathy for people who are in governing positions but then again that's their job okay and they've got to lead and they've got to make decisions that benefit not just the health sector but also the economic sector um, and there's mm. got to be that balance there, and we just not haven't had that balance, particularly now that in Australia, or certainly in Queensland here, we're 91 percent double jabbed, two jabbed, two jabs. Mm. My, my wife just had COVID. I've seen what it's like when someone gets it. It's not that bad. Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you just it's yeah, like yeah. a bad cold, and then you, it lasts about three or four days, and mm. then you got to, in Australia you got to isolate. Well, in Queensland, sorry again, you got to isolate seven days. Uh, and I had to as yeah, well, yeah. being a close contact, and it's just it's just nuts, mate. But um, yeah, mate, it's it's going to be with us for some time. And uh, let, let let me segue into a completely different topic, um, and back mm-hmm. on the music again, if that's cool, because uh, I, uh, I I probably I, it's hard to say which of my your albums is my favourite, but I think Two and Ella might be up there. Was that mm-hmm. was that an important album for you? Yes, uh, I remember when it came out. It it was like a little bit. I remember the record company as well. Were like, oh, "Are you serious? You know what to do." And uh, when we went to tour, there's there was a lot of like fans who were like disappointed to that mm-hmm. album, but also new fans. But it, at the time, it was like something like if you could call a musical suicide. <laughs> but uh, I think to us, it was very important. That, Personally, I like it very much as well. It's there. There isn't that many songs you could like play live these days. Actually, we don't do any of the songs live. I don't know why, but uh, as an album, I think it's very good. Like the whole whole album, and it have a special feelings and feeling. And uh, hmm. uh, to us, it was important, uh, like a journey to try and go because after that. Yeah, I think everything what we have done in the past affects what we are doing now. So, do, do you have that situation that a lot of bands that have been around with your with your great history have, which is that you get the the younger the eighteen year olds with the tales from a thousand lakes t shirt turning up or whatever it might be and mm. screaming out for the early songs and do do you have that issue? Mm. Uh, yeah, of course, but it's it's cool because we still play the old old stuff as well, so we. It's like, but but of course it's like if you're talking with somebody who just heard the like first two albums, it's uh, they don't necessarily know that yeah. <laughs> what the band is about today. But uh, yeah, but it, that's normal. I, I think it's fine. It's yeah, it's cool, especially if some young young kids are like uh, five in our bands after like mm. we've been around thirty years. It's it's cool. 30 years, yeah, it's it's crazy to think that. I feel like it was only yesterday I was buying a CD of Two and Ella, you know, and, and mm. getting into Elegy and getting into your stuff that way. But, of course, it's not yesterday. It was 25 years ago, whatever it was, 22, 23 mm. years ago that, that Two and Ella came out the 90s. It was in the 90s, for God's sakes, which yeah. is just another epoch altogether. Mm. Could, could, could you possibly have envisioned back then that you'd still be doing what you're doing now? No, no. <laughs> So that's one of the biggest, I think, the, the uh, archives of the, this band that we're still here. Because yeah, when we started, we were 16 or something and playing underground death metal. Nobody like record companies back then in Finland were uh, interested about us. And so, yeah, if somebody would have told me that we were still doing this after 30 years, almost 50 years old, guys uh, i would have laughed but uh, here we are so 
I think it's great. It's great. Like I never, never could imagine that this will be like our like lifetime job as well. It's pretty cool. Yeah, as I say, as a musician, I would have loved to have had an opportunity to. I mean, you guys worked hard for it. Don't get me wrong. There's no luck about it. I mean, you worked hard mm. and took your opportunities when they came along. But um, what what would you say has been has been you is or has been your your proudest accomplishment with the band? Um, I think to our band it has been this freedom to do like what we want. No record companies never like told me how how we should do or taking what new demos. So we have had this like freedom, musical freedom to do what we want, and also of course we get along together very good. So uh, that's like. That's like the main things that we are still here, I guess, and uh, everything else comes to top of it. Yeah. I'll make this my final question for you then. Uh, I haven't asked this one in a long time, but, you know, with, with a career and a history like what you've got, and you're a great guitarist, but if there's anything that you could change about your career, what would it be? Hmm, that's a tough one. I, I would like to say nothing because, like I said earlier, everything affects what we do now. If we would have made some mistakes in the past, we would do it now, maybe. And uh, I don't know. I wouldn't change anything. No good answer. I don't think I don't know. Yeah. I never, I never think of that way. If, if we would fucked up like totally or being like assholes, that, that would be like what I could change from the past but not like the normal decisions it's just part of life to do how the things feel at the at the time yeah yeah if i, if I remember right were you on relapse for a bit I, I, yeah, yeah yeah you were and then was, was it relapse to nuclear blast or was there a label in between oh uh, there was one album for emi well that was mistake <laughs> emi well there you go what was that like yeah that yeah, that that was a Finnish EMI, and nothing happens what they were promising, and we just wanted to check it out because there was some people working in that label at the time we knew, so we wanted to believe that okay, let's try this. But it went good. To Nuclear Blast has been like we have been working with them since relapse times because they were distributors in Europe, so we know the people, and now Atomic Fire, of course. Uh, so oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's sure. that's definitely the yeah. It's it's feel like uh, that's like your family in a way because you know the people. Some of the well, Marcus Steiger has been working uh, owning the label mm. for thirty years as long as the band. So it's we know that we are in good hands and have a freedom to do what we want. And uh, with the EMI, they already started to like having ideas what we should sound like or should we hire hire uh, some outsider composer and things like this and that was like not to us <laughs> hire an outsider composer we don't feel like product uh, yeah what were they going to do bring in Desmond Child or something <laughs> <laughs> that yeah maybe we could be rich now so. <laughs> or uh, the guy from Roxette I can't remember his name. Yeah. You know, they, they come up with the stupidest ideas, don't they, Majors? They've got no idea how to try yeah, yeah, yeah. No idea. Yeah. Yeah, I know. yeah, yeah. Mate, fantastic to talk to you finally. Uh, good Congratulations uh, on the career to date. You can tell I'm a fan. Uh, but look, good luck with the album. And just please, I just hope with everything, hopefully getting back to normal sometime soon, we see you down here sometime in the near future. Yeah, let's hope so. And it uh, would be nice to come down there to have a small tour maybe some have a small tour and some beer mate <laughs> yeah <laughs> alright thanks very much brother appreciate the chat hey thank you take care thanks mate catch ya bye there he is ladies and gentlemen that was Tommy from the Finnish group Amorphous I hope you enjoyed listening into that conversation the group's new album is titled Halo and it'll be released on the 11th of February 2022 big news from my part of the world 
my book. It'll be out on the 20th of February. It is a bit of a biographical account of my experiences conducting many of the conversations for the podcast. So if you like what it is that I do for the podcast and YouTube, same thing, you'll be able to dive into many of my thoughts and recollections on those conversations throughout the book. It'll soon to be available for pre-order on Amazon. I'm going to put up a bunch of links in my website or on my website or post them over there anyway, scarsandguitars.com. I'll put some links in the YouTube and also the podcast widget as well. Just hit me up on socials either way if you're interested or want to have a chat about things. I'm easy to have a conversation with everybody that I've spoken to that is connected with me via the podcast has been very cool and I don't expect that to change anytime soon. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Until next time, it is a very good bye for now.